Among the many terrible features of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 12 countries are crafting something that would give corporations unprecedented power. A secret court for capitalist enterprises to sue any country that infringes on profits. As it stands with investment treaties skewed in their favor, multinational corporations enjoy the freedom to pillage developing countries. When people suffer disease, death, and environmental devastation as a result, they simply claim there's no jurisdiction where they can be made to answer to a court. From obliterating ecosystems to taking human lives to maximize profits, the shareholder's cash is protected by this legal obstacle course. Thousands of corporate crimes go unchecked every year, but some incidents have been so horrifying that public outcry has exposed this legal impunity. Like in Bhopal, India, where Dow Chemical subsidiary Union Carbide released 40 tons of several lethal gases, exposing more than 600,000 people to a poisonous cloud that has killed an estimated 25,000 cents and left many more maimed. The area remains heavily contaminated, and Dow has refused to accept any real responsibility to the victims or to clean up the toxic site. Or the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh. In 2013, a multi-level clothing factory collapsed due to extremely unsafe, cost-cutting building conditions. It left more than 1,100 people dead. Brands that use Bangladeshi labor, like H&M, Walmart, and Gap, then pledged to enforce building and worker safety. But three years later, nothing's been done, and these businesses are free to continue to operate under criminally unsafe standards. Then there's Chevron Texaco's oil dumping disaster in Ecuador's Amazon rainforest, where the company instituted a systematic dumping process of toxic sludge into the most pristine habitat on Earth. They've been ducking legal responsibility for decades. Despite several international human rights treaties that countries must follow, there are none that apply to corporations, despite the fact that 37 of the top 100 economies in the world are corporations. While the corporate elite flex their power across the planet, one small country has been leading a fight to hold them accountable for their crimes against humanity. Ecuador has been spearheading a project in the United Nations to create a binding legal instrument that for the first time would hold corporations accountable for human rights violations in the countries they extract profits from. Leading this bold initiative is Maria Fernanda Espinosa, Ecuador's permanent representative to the UN, also having served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and of National Defense under President Correa. She joined me at the Telesource studio in Quito to discuss this historic venture and how Ecuador ended up on the forefront of this fight. I think that Ecuador is not the only case where uh, big corporations, uh, you know, sue uh, states uh, because one reason or another, because uh, they use the frameworks of bilateral investment treaties. We just uh, so with satisfaction, I, I have to say, uh, the lawsuit of Philip Morris against Uruguay, the, the Uruguayan government, because uh, the laws on on public health regarding. Uh, tobacco consumption mm. and uh, Uruguay won, which is very, very, very uh, uh, special. You know, most of the cases are always won by the big corporations and not by the states that are sued. The case of Ecuador, I think, is very emblematic. If you look at lawsuits against the government of, uh, of Egypt, against uh, other governments of the world, precisely, it's, it's really uh, you know, the world upside down because uh, usually the case is that big transnational corporations have violated uh, human rights standards mm -hmm. or environmental standards and they end up suing, uh, you know, suing uh, the countries where they operate. In the case of Egypt, it's a uh, big transnational corporations, the uh, corporation that sued the Egyptian government. Why? Because they increased the minimum wage. 
uh, you know, because of, of uh, you know, the cost of living, and they decided as a very sovereign decision that they were going to increase uh, their, their uh, minimum wage. And at the end of the story is that they were sued by this company because they were affecting, you know, the amount of money that they were, you know, uh, getting from X or Y contract. So it's, as I say, it's, it's, it's the world upside down. Uh, we, we should, you know, work to hire the human rights standards, labor standards, environmental standards uh, in general, but we're doing the opposite in terms of uh, how to be competitive, how to be competitive in, in the world we live in, uh, in the capitalist world. It means that you have to decrease uh, the, uh, the standards, the labor standards, for example, and, and make uh, the environmental standards more flexible. And that is attr attractive for investment. That's where, you know, international processes mm -hmm. that are ongoing are so important because they're going to level the playing field uh, to have a better, better world because no one can, you, you know, not acknowledge the increasing power of transnational corporations. Not only financial power because they have more money than any GDP of a country of the developed world but also a, con a political influence and in, in political power as well. How did that evolve to where transnational corporations actually hold more power than states and in some cases like in Ecuador they acted as the state to implement its own um, standards and, and reforms? Well I, I think this is part of, of the outcome of the globalization process. Uh, you know that almost 80 percent of the goods and services that are produced around the world uh, are, are produced in a fragmented, delocalized way, which means that uh, the, the, the power of these transnational corporations, even if they have a host country, a country of origin, they operate f a, in a fragmented way all over the, the world. And basically, uh, what are the issues that they look at in terms of competitiveness is uh, a low wages, uh, you know, very flexible uh, domestic uh, uh, environmental uh, regulations in order to produce at the lower cost possible and increase uh, the amount of money that they, they get themselves. And, and that's uh, almost a law in the capitalist world. It's accumulation and profit and not about human rights and the dignity of people. Uh, and that's what countries like Ecuador were trying to, to change this pattern, this way of thinking. Uh, since I, I deal with, in the, we know, with international, in the international arena, in the UN um, uh, space, you see that uh, there is uh, a, a will, there is an intention of saying, uh, yes, uh, we need profit. Uh, we need to do business, but we cannot do it at the expenses of uh, the dignity of people and, and at the destruction of the environment. We cannot continue that way. I mean, we need uh, different parameters, different values, different ethics to operate. And of course, it's not sustainable at the end of the day. This race to the bottom is simply not sustainable in the global spectrum. Let's talk about when Ecuador really came on the map as a target for Western powers and corporations with the presidential administration of Correa. Um, what reforms did he make that really angered these corporations and the U.S. government? Well, first of all, to, to say that we are uh, a country uh, uh, which is able to make its own sovereign decisions on issues, that we don't receive any instructions from any country, that uh, we are able to design our own future, our own political model, our own economic model. That already, you know, I think creates a shock. That is common sense for us, but not, it's not seen as common sense for others, especially the Western powers. But in terms of, of the sovereignty in dealing with our strategic resources, we renegotiated all the oil contracts. Uh, we have to remember that in, uh, prior to President Correa, basically the ratio was 80-20. 80 for the company, 80% of the revenues, and 20% for the owners of the resource, uh, the people of Ecuador. And basically we switched the other, the other way around, we changed the nature of the contracts, a, a concession contracts by a service contracts, and of course the revenues multiplied. 
And with these resources, uh, we uh, basically boosted public investment. Public investment in what? In, in basic infrastructure, but uh, uh, you know, above all, education, public health, and and we, uh, you know, became a strong state. Uh, representing not the interest and the, and the big powers international but also domestically you know the big elites mm -hmm. that uh, were uh, you know so used to own the country the people of Ecuador to own the media to own the political parties the justice system in that this power correlation completely changed and then what you we we built is a state that really represented the will of people, but above all, represented uh, the powerless, uh, the voiceless, the vulnerable. And this model sometimes creates uncomfort at, at the, you know, from the side of, of, of the big powers, but also of our domestic opposition, I have to say. Mm -hmm. How dare Ecuador take its own resources and use it for social services? That, that doesn't bode well with oil corporations. Of course, we saw with the Occidental Petroleum case um, just this year, right? I mean, Ecuador had to shell out a yes. massive amount of money. Yes, hundreds of millions of dollars that we could, you know, very well invest this amount of money in improving, increasing, you know, public investment mm -hmm. uh, for the good of, of the majority of, of the Ecuadorians. And I think that there is something that is not working properly. Uh, which is, first of all, uh, the bilateral investment treaties and the arbitration mechanisms, which in most cases run against uh, states and, and the interest of the people of this particular state. And Ecuador uh, has uh, had a strong voice and is working, you know, uh, internationally and regionally to rethink the whole arbitration system and we're trying to build an arbitration mechanism at least for UNASUR for the 12 uh, South American uh, states but we have also an international voice looking mm -hmm. at, at this issue uh, you know with the alternatives what are the alternatives of bilateral investment treaties but Ecuador is not alone uh, for example uh, recently, South Africa, I think Indonesia, uh, other countries are uh, denouncing all the bilateral investment mm -hmm. treaties because they, they, it's not only a loss of sovereignty, but it's a, it's a clear, you know, damage for the interest of a particular state, but of the of the people of the of the poor of the world. Uh, it's it's really. Uh, we need a different kind of uh, social and political pact because now it happens that transnational corporations, they have all the rights, but they have no responsibility. And we, we knew that uh, Chevron is, is a huge corporation with enormous power, but uh, we, have to, we had to raise our voice. And I think that it, it was useful at the end because other countries started to wake up in a way and say, yes, I mean, we, we can have a voice, we, we have to say it. Uh, you know, in the international arena, we have to stop that. And that's uh, why uh, disasters like uh, the Bangladesh uh, disasters, the Rana Plaza uh, disaster, or the case of Bhopal in India, now are better known. And there are now, uh, you know, academics around the world that are, you know, uh, pi pi doing compilations of massive human rights violations uh, by uh, transnational corporations. So we need different rules of the game, that's for sure. You've introduced this binding instrument that would, for the first time, actually hold corporations accountable for human rights, set some sort of international standard. First of all, it's 2016. Why does this not exist <laughs> already? Well, you know that it's been a battle within the UN for 70 years. Uh, already President Allende in, in Chile noticed in a, in a public speech at the UN General Assembly saying we have to be very careful about the increasing power of, of the big corporations and they need regulation, we need clear rules for them to operate. And uh, you know even after 70 years so many attempts uh, of regulating, of coming up with certain kind of uh, of uh, binding rules for uh, corporations, especially uh, regarding human rights standards, environmental standards. And every intent and every effort 
ha, you know, just melted in the air. Why? Because of, of the big lobbying power of the corporations themselves, of a lack of political will, of, uh, you know, all these forces that, uh, you know, they work uh, for, uh, for, you know, to feed the greed of our world in a way or another. And, and because, you know, simply because the political power of cor the cor some corporations is huge, is even more, you know, important and influential than any, any member mm -hmm. state. But uh, in 2014, Ecuador and South Africa decided to pass a resolution within the Human Rights Council calling for a negotiation process for a, a legally binding instruments on transnational corporations and human rights. And believe me that the lobbying of certain countries, of the big corporations around the world, saying, please do not vote in favor of this resolution, you cannot imagine the level of pressure, uh, uh, the blackmailing. Uh, and at the end, the resolution passed. Uh, we won. Uh, I think, uh, you know, common sense won, ethics won at the end. In my opinion, if, if we are successful, the 21st century treaty on human rights is going to boost, uh, you know, reshape uh, international law uh, on human rights. And it's a need, it's a pressing need because of the issues that we see, you know, around the world. Not only the Chevron case, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, the operation of Shell in, in Nigeria. Uh, I already mentioned the Bhopal case in India, the, the, the Rana Plaza case in Bangladesh, but there's so many cases of human rights violations, of environmental damage in developing, in developed countries, in Europe. We have seen uh, the Viola case uh, in, uh, in Germany, for example. And all this is crying for clear rules internationally you know, to level the playing field, to have legal certainty when uh, any company invests in X or Y country, especially when we are facing such a fragmented uh, commodity chain. You know, all the value chains need to be, uh, you know, tracked in a way or another. And we are looking at a treaty that would look at this extraterritorial way of producing, you know, goods and services around the world. I think people may be interested to understand how this process works now before the binding instrument. Through the bilateral investment treaties, corporations, they had all the rights. Most of the time they, 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 they had the reason in all the rights wherever they operated, by, but no responsibilities. If something happened, the responsible uh, part was the state that hosted the investment or and the corporation. For victims, it's very important to know where to go in terms of a, you know, a lawsuit, for example. Right. Uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of jurisdiction is very important. I, I don't want to be too technical, sure. but when something happens, with a human rights mass viola violation happens, uh, there is not even a court or a place where you can go and the issues of jurisdiction. We have suffered that with Chevron. Some of, the, uh, most of the courts in the US, they said, no, I mean, you don't have jurisdiction here. No, it doesn't go. I mean, you have to go here and there and there and no one accepts the case because we need a mechanism internationally that would deal with this issue in an objective way, in a very ethical way. If you look, if we look at how the, uh, arbitration mechanisms uh, work nowadays. It's just terrible. It's it really, it, it hurts. Um, as someone who is very experienced in the field of human rights and uh, legislates in them, you know, no country lectures the world more or arbitrates human rights more than the United States of America, of course. What double standards do you see in the human rights arena on an international level? Well, I, I think it's very imp uh, interesting. You know, sometimes the media, they don't pay that much attention to the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three sessions uh, per year. And it's so telling, you know, what happens in Room 20 uh, in the UN in, in, in Geneva because uh, basically the Human Rights Council was created to ensure that monitoring of uh, proper standards of human rights were applied equally around the world. Human rights are indivisible, are universal. Uh, the council has to be objective. 
non-discriminatory. But what happens is that uh, the Human Rights Council has become, you know, the center of uh, a political battle. And human rights are now being used to, you know, attack uh, certain countries and not others. There are countries where you see silence. Uh, you know, going on in their countries that are, f you know, the favorite countries, you know, to be, you know, blamed and shamed because of their human rights standard. And, and it has become a political battlefield. And uh, while well, Ecuador is there, we are members of the Human Rights Council now, which means that we have the right to vote. Uh, 47 countries uh, are members of the Council and have the right to vote. The rest of the countries, uh, the, you know, 193, they're not all members. And uh, we have to, you know, struggle and fight to have uh, really to put human rights above any particular political interest or legitimize any unilateral military intervention in, in, in a country. And there is a whole trend now, uh, unfortunately, uh, to uh, bring the Human Rights Council deliberations to the Security Council at the UN. It's very which dangerous. Is very dangerous. And we are really uh, struggling for that and trying to bring other countries with us to make sure that doesn't, it doesn't happen because we know that the, the, the Security Council is the most undemocratic body of the United Nations and there are five countries that decide uh, for all of us and, and most of the time they don't take the right decisions. We have proven that uh, models that are truly democratic, uh, truly on the interest of the majorities, uh, models that are even, I would say, more creative, that don't take, uh, you know, the capitalist model uh, and the uh, neoliberalism as the only recipe, as the only uh, possible way. But we have questioned that, and, and not only questioned that, but just created, uh, created something different. Uh, with creativity, but also with political responsibility. And we have proven that it works. But for some, this is very dangerous to prove that you can actually shape and craft a different model, a different way of organizing society in a more progressive, open, decolonized way, if, if, if you wish. And uh, that, of course, becomes dangerous because it counters, uh, you know, the common sense, the so-called common sense. Uh, and the, the current on, ongoing, you know, capitalist model.